secure back there, Dustin. All right. Okay, well. I'm not sure if all of you saw the news yesterday. Um, I caught part of it that uh, the state of Hawaii had quite a shock yesterday, quite a thrill. Uh, as I was picking up bits and pieces of what actually was going on, I guess they went to test one of their kind of used to be like the civil defense preparedness uh, early warning system, and apparently they hadn't been testing it much recently. Uh, that used to be tested quite a bit during the Cold War. Back in the day when we were always kind of in a toe-to-toe -to -toe confrontation with the Soviet Union. But after the Soviet Union collapsed and, you know, all that stuff started to die down, you know, we tended to not worry so much about a a nuclear attack against the United States, which the Soviet Union was very capable of launching. But there weren't too many others in the world that could actually do that. China has up, kind of come up on that and, you know, has a lot of in, in, intercontinental continental ballistic missiles. And, but, you know, because of the doctrine of uh, mutual destruction, total between the United States and the Soviet Union, mutual assured destruction. In other words, if they pushed their button and we pushed our button, man, it was over. Uh, but after the collapse, a lot of people perceived that threat to have died down. And so there's been some effort in reducing those things. Well, then you got North Korea up and coming, up and coming. So somebody thought maybe we need to be testing the old alarm system on test, on test. And they pushed the wrong button. So everybody in Hawaii got the message, there is an incoming ballistic missile. This is no drill. Now, unfortunately for those folks, because of where they just so happen to be located in the Pacific Ocean, they get 20 minutes of warning. 20 minutes to have your life flashing before your eyeballs. And it was panic city, as you would imagine, in Hawaii. And it took the people that were supposed to be trying to deal with this thing 38 minutes to get the basic all clear, false alarm, go back to doing what you're doing, sure. <laughs> 38 minutes they thought they were going to die. You know, I don't know how much people pay attention, you know, really to try to understand the power of nuclear weapons and why it's a big deal. We've kind of re really perfected them and refined them. We can actually fire nukes out of an artillery piece. A lot of people don't know that. We're on our submarines, we have them on aircraft, and we have them in silos in the ground. We got all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> the nukes we dropped on Japan back in World War II were in the kiloton range. They were firecrackers. And I, it's been a long time since I read about that stuff, but it was like hot as the surface of the sun, man. We're talking about winds going out of ground zero at over 900 miles an hour. I mean, people disappeared. Their shadows were burned in bridges. Those are some pretty famous pictures. People were just vaporized, gone, at ground zero. But the destruction goes way out. Back in the day when I was working up to the Federal Center, we used to have war games. Used to be two a year, one was nuclear, one was conventional. And for the nuclear ones, I was the damage assessment, bomb damage assessment officer, and I was given all kinds of information. Some of it was classified secret, so if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <coughs> I've forgotten half of what I knew about some of that stuff. But, 
the, the, the stuff that ain't classified, the bomb damage from a nuke, see, they, they would, uh, in the war game, they would identify certain U.S. installations, military bases that were hit. They'd give me the specifics, whether it was, you know, it was a nuclear weapon, ground burst, air burst, and the, and the megaton range of the bomb, and the distance the bomb was, ground zero, from the base. And then we had the, I had these booklets that gave me all the information about the base, whether the buildings were primarily reinforced concrete or wooden structures. Kind of interesting, this would mean nothing to you, but at, at Pendleton, a lot of the buildings there at Pendleton years ago were mostly wood frame. The buildings at uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina are heavy because of the hurricanes coming in from the, you know, the Atlantic. So different structures. So, you know, a lot of the different military bases have all those different things. And how many personnel and what kind of uh, living quarters. So you had these graphs and these formulas that you could tell by the megatonnage, whether, where the base was from ground zero, air burst, ground burst, and they never blow up on the ground. A ground burst is just below so many thousand feet is considered a ground burst. And under a certain megaton range, one over Battle Creek, which is total destruction, fire likely in Lansing. Fire likely. There's rings that go out from these things that tell you about, you know, from the total destruction with no residual capability down to how far the blast. So you figure fire likely in Lansing, Michigan, that's about 45, 50 miles away. Unbelievable destruction. We got some big ones today, real big ones. Now, I don't know how much the average person in Hawaii realizes all that stuff, but for people in the know, that's a real serious thought. You know, Hawaii ain't all that big. And if you got a nuke coming, it ain't going to be good. And where are you going to hide? What I did hear a little bit on the news, because I, it's probably more information today as it's all pouring in from people. A lot of their testimonies, people were freaked out. I re, uh, one guy was saying how he grabbed his family and he put them all in the bathtub and got in there and pulled a mattress over the top of them. Look, if you, I can't imagine what the kids thought. Probably scaring them just... When parents are freaked out and scared and stuffing you in the bathtub and climbing in there and pulling the mattress on top, I'm sure that happens, you know, when the big tornadoes are coming. You know, we get tornado warnings here, too. You better be, you know, considering that. But at least with the tornado, you think you've got some chance because how big can the thing be? Now, they've had some big ones. They've had them on the ground two miles wide at the bottom. I mean, down in Texas and Oklahoma and some of them places far as you can see the devastation so you know my thoughts went to those poor people yesterday and of course once they got past the fear then they were mad and blaming Trump it's his fault you know and but you wonder for 38 minutes when people were hugging their kids and wonder what was going through their mind now that it's over because you're not going to survive it. It's going to be unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, it's not there. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to doing what you're doing. You know, I don't know how many people would actually take the time to think, reflect. You know, I've, obviously, the last week or two, I have talked about time and and making the days count, redeeming the time. The days are evil. The Bible, warn, 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 warn. See, God gives us plenty of warning. We got more than 38 minutes. Well, granted, we don't know how much time we got. We, we don't have 38 minutes. You know, uh, as individuals even, because really what matters is you personally, right? I mean, you might not want a whole bunch of people to get blown up, but you don't want yourself personally. You know, the Bible does tell us that our lives are very temporal, very shaky. Our lives are only a vapor. 
And according to Luke 13, Jesus said, look, it's not how you die, it's the state you're in when you die, because Pilate had done killed some of the Galileans, mingled their blood and their sacrifices, and then the, the tower in Siloam tipped over and killed 18 people, a little industrial mishap there. Probably an earthquake brought it down. Uh, boom. You know, and that's the thing, too, about an earthquake. You can't predict it. And when it happens, it's like a stroke. You guys in the medical field know, they, they tell you that, well, if a person has a stroke, the damage is done. You can't get there fast enough to intercede to make a difference. Uh, the damage is done. An earthquake, no warning, boom, the buildings fall down. It can be destructive over a wide area, but a hurricane gives us a lot of warning. They can plot those things. They keep telling people, get out of town, flee, get to the higher ground, go. Some people have a hurricane party instead. I wonder what some of them think in a Category 4, Category 5 after the storm hits and all of a sudden they feel like that whole world out there has come to an end and here they are sitting in that house that they should have left a long time ago. Some people ain't got no sense at all. But the Bible warns us of an end of all things. Now, that happens to individuals all the time. There have been a whole lot of people that have lived on this earth are gone. That's just simply the way of all the earth. But God gives us plenty of warning. Plenty of warning. Now, warnings are not something you're supposed to worry about. It's not what a warning is all about. A warning is about preparation. It's preparedness. That's the purpose and the intent of a warning is not to fret about it or worry about it. The purpose is to prepare, be prepared, be informed. When they put on the pack of smokes, warning. Smoking these cigarettes can kill you. That cigarette ain't going to jump out of that pack and kill you. It's telling you don't light it up and stick it in your mouth and suck in that poison smoke. And if you ain't going to pick it up and smoke it, you don't have to worry about the warnings on a cigarette pack. You don't have to worry. Don't smoke. I've said this before. In the immortal words of the wise sage, Mr. Miyagi, best way to avoid punch, not be there. Don't want to die in Detroit? Don't go to Detroit. You can't die in Detroit if you don't go to Detroit. Don't smoke. Don't have to worry about cigarettes killing you. Something's going to kill you. But you don't have to worry about cigarettes. So being warned is the purpose is preparedness. When God warns in the Bible, he, he not try to scare people. Now, if you choose to w ignore the warning, you better be scared. Because he's not kidding. A lot of people don't, they choose not to heed warnings. Just ignore it for various reasons. We don't pay any attention to the warnings. Now, obviously, the people in Hawaii would have no way to prepare for a nuclear blast. But if they were terrorized by it, I can submit to you that it's because they were not prepared to die. There ain't nothing you're going to do about the nuke. There ain't nothing you're going to do about not dying. You're going to die. That's the way of all the earth. But what we see in the Bible, there were many of the biblical greats, the Bible greats, that did not fear death. Why? Because they was prepared for it. What is preparation? Well, it's information. You take in information, you assimilate the information, make decisions based on information. Full of choices there. And we get... To make choices. 
So when the warning is given, we look at what the warning consists of, we look at that information, and we make the application to our own lives to be prepared. You know, uh, when the roads are bad, you slow down. You know, that's a choice. Some people don't. They end up upside down the ditch. You maybe put a seat belt down. Look, you can do a lot of things to be, more, to be prepared, to be careful, to be cautious, but yet stuff can still happen. The other guy ain't paying attention. You're doing everything you're supposed to. You're not texting and driving. You're slowing down. You come up. You've got the right of way as you approach the intersection, and here comes somebody blazing through the intersection, not paying attention. Boom, things happen. That's why it's just best to be prepared to die. To be prepared to leave this place, to go on to your next life. You don't have to worry about nothing. Don't have to worry about anything. Ain't no reason to worry. Don't worry. Unless you're not prepared. Now the day is coming. That's what the scripture says. The day is coming. You know, I personally believe... I'm sure you do too. It's pretty evident in the scripture. The reason why there's no security here for anybody is because God wants people, in a sense, to be a little bit uncomfortable so they can do something about it. We're, we're creatures of comfort. We like to be comfortable. We pursue pleasure and we avoid pain. That's just us naturally. And when we're warned about something that could come, it's because it's telling you there's some uncomfortable stuff coming here. Are you ready? So we want to be prepared because we want to minimize our discomfort. If you think about it. You know, I always throw a heavier winter coat in my car when it's really cold. I don't wear it all the time. It's in my, inside my, my car, my trunk. Why? Well, just in case... I end up stuck on the side of the road for whatever reason, or I got to get out and help somebody. I don't want to be too cold and freezing my butt off out there. So I got a parka in the bag. That's all. I'm just prepared. I got a first aid kit in my car. Not so much for myself, but in case I have to help somebody else, I'm going to be a little bit prepared because I'd feel really bad if I was standing right there and I couldn't just help somebody with a simple control of bleeding or something without having to give them my shirt. In a freezing cold, <laughs> a little preparedness, that's all. So God wants us to not be able to trust in nothing here except him, ultimately. If you absolutely trust in God and he's got you covered, you don't have to think or worry about nothing. Because it ain't going to matter. Finally, we'll leave this place, and all the worry would have been for nothing. So, don't worry. Be happy. You knew that was coming. <clears throat> In Jeremiah, we'll go through this. Uh, you know, this is just a great Old Testament prophet. First off, the word of the Lord, uh, uh, Jeremiah 11 and 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah said, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now let me, I guess, give you a little bit of heads up here. Jeremiah is a tremendous prophet. Now he's warning God's people, and we'll see the, the passage in a second, for a long time, warning them. First off, God wants to bless you, but he said, but again, but if you don't want to pay attention to that, then bad stuff is coming. So warning, heed the warning. So Jeremiah is one of those great prophets to warn, but the people don't pay no attention to him, so disaster does come. Hear the words of the covenant, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Say to them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of the covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, so that you shall be my people, 
I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. And I answered and said, So be it, Lord. Then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the word of this covenant and do them, for I earnestly exhort your father, earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early, exhorting them, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey, nor incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. <clears throat> God said, when I brought you out way back then, I intended to bless you. You'd be my people. I would be your God. I'd be taking you right into this land flowing with milk and honey, but you have not. He said, I've sent prophets to you, but you didn't obey or incline your ear. And everyone just did their own thing, following the evil dictates of their own hearts. Now, there's disaster coming. Now, if you go to Jeremiah 25... <clears throat> Verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah. And you know, this is about God's people. These are just not Gentile nations. They didn't know God. These are his people. Always emphasize that. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, here he's telling them, look, he said, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, which is the 23rd year in which the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early, sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear. They said, Repent now, everyone, of this evil way and of his evil doings, and dwell in the land which the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. Don't go after the other gods to serve them and to worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of bride, groom the voice of the bride the sound of the millstones the light of the lamp and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of babylon 70 years <clears throat> 70 years captivity you know it's like a new kit that place when you go back and read it I mean, they literally tore it down with their hands, the Babylonians, flattened Jerusalem and the temple <clears throat> and killed the people with the sword and took the remnant captive into Babylon. Warned them. And Jeremiah said, I've been warning you for 23 years. Of course, their response was, uh, let me see, I think number, uh, sorry, Jeremiah 26 here. Uh, Jeremiah 26, let me see here, 7 through 11. So the priests and the prophets and the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, that the priests and the prophets and the people seized him, saying, You're going to die. They're going to kill him. He didn't like it. This Trump's fault. Now, 
I'm not talking politically, I'm talking matter of fact, if you think about it for a minute. They're blaming the guy that's trying to warn them here. You know, if there's a nuke coming from North Korea, did it ever occur to you that maybe the guy over there might have a little bit of responsibility for this at all? A little bit of responsibility? You know, warnings for people, we have a responsibility when the warning comes to, to take heed, to decide what we're going to do about it. And getting mad about it or blaming the messenger isn't going to solve the problem or be very helpful. There is a problem. This world is a dangerous, dangerous place. And there's all kinds of things that we need to be concerned about, maybe as a nation, as a people, or simply as individuals. There's, there's certain warnings that pertain to you. Maybe you've been to the doctor lately. And the doctor tells you that you have high blood pressure. And you need to pay attention to what you're eating. Or he prescribes a medicine for you. He didn't prescribe it for me. And he warns you, if you don't get that blood pressure down, you could have a stroke. That's not for everybody. That's for you. But there are things that concern all of us. In a physical sense, as a nation, as a people, as a culture, and us as individuals. But spiritually, spiritually, that affects everybody in the whole world. In the whole world. These physical things in the Old Testament are so powerful because they're, they're just a microcosm of what's being done in a macro sense all the time. Something that people need to take heed to. The priests and the prophets of the people said, we're going to kill you. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house will be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, sat down the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. The priests, the prophet, spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, this Jeremiah guy, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. They didn't like it. God's people, the princes, the prophets. The, let's kill them. Anyway, they go into captivity. Babylon shows up, just like he said they would. Off they go. But there was a remnant. This is kind of unfortunate. I don't say it's funny. It's just typical people. There was a remnant out in the field when that happened. Soldiers came back. Place was destroyed. And they didn't know what to do. Jeremiah was there. He was still there. Remember I read, I think, last week, the captain of Nebuchadnezzar's army told Jeremiah, you know why this happened to your people, right? Because they rejected the Lord their God and wouldn't obey him. But now you're free to go wherever you want to go. You can go with us to Babylon, or you can stay here. Now, he treated Jeremiah kindly because he knew he was the servant, the prophet of the Most High God. And so Jeremiah chose to stay. Well, this, these captains of the forces showed up, but the place was a wreck, God's people. So they came to Jeremiah. Verse 1, Jeremiah 42. 1. Now the captains of the forces, Johanan, the son of Kera, Jezaniah, the Hosiah, all the people from the least to the greatest came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, please, let our petition be acceptable to you and pray for us that the Lord your God, for, to the Lord your God, pray to the Lord your God for this remnant since we are left but a few of many as you can see. That the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard. Indeed, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare it to you. I will keep nothing back from you. And they said to Jeremiah, let the Lord be true and faithful witness between us. 
if we do not do according to everything which the Lord your God sends by you, whether it pleases us or if it's displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. It happened after ten days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So he calls these guys, these captains of the forces which were with him, all from all the peoples from the least to the greatest, and said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition before him, if you will still remain in this land, God says, I will build you up. I will build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I relent concerning the disaster that I have brought upon you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you, to deliver you from his hand. I will show you mercy, that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, we will go to the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor be hungry for bread, and there we will dwell. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you wholly set your faces to enter Egypt and go to dwell there, then it shall be that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. The famine of which you were afraid shall follow close after you in Egypt, and there you shall die. So shall it be with all the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to dwell there. They shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. And none of them shall remain or escape from the disaster that I will bring upon them. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my fury have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so will my fury be poured out on you when you enter Egypt, and you shall be an oath and an astonishment, a curse and a reproach, and you shall see this place no more." The Lord has said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Now know certainly that I have admonished you this day, for you were hypocrites in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us, for the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord your God says, so declare to us, and we will do it. And I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, or anything which he has sent to you by me. Now therefore know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desired to go to dwell. This is funny. Now it happened when Jeremiah had stopped speaking to all the people the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them with all these words, that all these guys come up to Jeremiah in verse 2, and these proud men spoke to Jeremiah and said, You're lying. I think that's where the New International, you know, in mine it says, you speak falsely. But I think the NIV said, you're lying. You're lying. Sound like kids. You're lying. Dad didn't want me to do that. Either. <laughs> you speak falsely. The Lord our God hasn't sent you to say, don't go to Egypt to dwell there. But Barak, the son of Nera, who has set you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that they may put us to death or carry us away captive to Babylon. So these guys said, we ain't going. So verse 7 says, so they went to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they went as far as the Panaphes. They went to Egypt. They came to Jeremiah after the disaster of the destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> And the place was a wreck. And they come to Jeremiah and they go, what are we going to do? Look, will you please go to God for us and find out exactly what he wants us to do and whether it pleases us or, or even if it's displeasing, no matter what, we'll do it. He said, okay. 
I'll go check with God. I'll get back with you. Ten days later, okay, I got the, the information for you that you sent me to go get for you. God says, look, stay in the land. You stay in the land. I will build you up. I won't pull you down. I will plant you, not pluck you up. I relent concerning the disaster that I brought on you. And don't be afraid of this here king of Babylon of whom you're afraid. Don't be afraid of him. I'm with you to save you, to deliver. You stay here. But if you don't, if you refuse, if you rebel, and you head to Egypt, well, I know that's where you want to go. You think you're going to be safe there? That's where the sword that you fear is going to overtake you in the land of Egypt. The famine which you were afraid will follow will close right behind you in Egypt, and there you shall die. You're lying. <laughs> Jeremiah said, you played the hypocrite when you sent me to go find out. You had no intention of doing what God wanted you to do at all. God probably told Jeremiah, and oh, by the way, Jeremiah, psst, psst, hey, phew, they ain't going to do it. And Jeremiah's like, what the heck? We're weird, you know what? People are weird. Easy. <laughs> we get so much information, so much proof. We're so confident that this word cannot be broken. I was like, Amen, brother. And we never do what we... What's wrong with us? We don't heed the warnings. We do not heed them. I feel for the guy crawling in the bathtub with his kids in there trying to pull a mattress over him because he thought his life is over. I can't even imagine 38 minutes thinking, what am I going to do if we do survive this? What, what, what are we going to do? I, I, I don't know, maybe you've heard more news. You know, I was a little concerned, you know, because back when Orson Welles did that radio broadcast in 1938, War of the Worlds, and it came on, this is, no, you know, this is for real, the Martians have landed, you know, we're being invaded by Mars, and people freaked out, and some committed suicide. That was supposed to be a holiday, I think it was Halloween. It was supposed to be like a spoof. But it was broadcast like it was the real deal, and people freaked right out and started jumping out windows. There was another time, and I only remember that it happened. I can't remember where, but that same thing of the wrong code put in during what was supposed to be. This is a drill of the you know national emergency broadcast system. You know, beep, this high pitch, like what the heck, you know, how's that? They plugged in an attack code, but they hurried up and got the, out of it. I don't know how they messed that up, but I haven't heard whether somebody got killed yesterday in Hawaii because in a panic. Imagine what you would do. You're at work, and you just got the word the nuke is coming, and your kids are home. What would you do? Probably get in your car and drive 100 miles an hour, knowing you've got less than 20 minutes to get there to hug your kids and kiss them goodbye. I haven't heard whether that happened or not, but I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if somebody died yesterday in Hawaii. Has anybody heard that anybody did because they're in a panic? Bach told me that when the communists were coming into Saigon with the tanks, and he was told by the Americans, the last one's out of there, Bach, if you're going, let's go. He didn't know he was being evacuated. He had to get Michelle. She was home. He got in his car. He was driving down the sidewalk. Blew two tires off his car. It was panic. The whole city was in panic because they knew these communists were going to kill many, many thousands of people. Terror. So there are some people that have actually experienced that type of thing. The watchmen were supposed to be warned. God told Ezekiel in Ezekiel 33, I'm setting you as a watchman. You need to warn the people. When you see that sword coming, Eze uh, yeah, Ezekiel 33, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of now he's in the captivity. Ezekiel is in the captivity with everybody else. 
prophet of God. Not, not because he was bad. He grew up in it. Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, when I bring a sword on the land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and they make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming on the land, if he blowed the trumpet and warned the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, didn't take the warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and doesn't blow the trumpet and the people are not warned, then the sword come and take any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, that's for sure. But his blood I'll require it at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he doesn't turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore, O oh son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil way, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God's the good guy here. The warning is a positive thing because it's for preparedness. To be warned, to be aware, to take the appropriate action, to save your souls alive. I had some other verses to bring out, but for time's sake, I'm going to go right to uh, right there in Second Peter. In Second Peter, chapter three. <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter three. Peter said, Beloved, I now write to you in the second epistle, and both of the way in which I stir up your pure minds as a way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers are going to come in the last days. You know, the Bible says these are the last days. In fact, I didn't give it to you, but I'll just give it to you. It's a you can, first Peter four and seven. Don't go there. But at the end of all things, Peter says at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things at hand. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last day, walking according to their own lust, saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, Peter said, there they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which, that, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But now the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, reserved for fire until the, judgment, until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Peter writes, Beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, but the Lord isn't slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord coming, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Then therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of the heavens which will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements melting with a fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
Some people say, yeah, right. See, that's what they do. They don't think about nukes or, you know, they think, well, that stuff ain't never going to happen. How many times does that have come upon people who never would have thought that would ever happen? And lo and behold, it did. They don't pay attention. There's too much time. We become dull of hearing and we get lackadaisical, apathetic. And then all of a sudden some reality comes upon us. Maybe it ain't nukes or Armageddon or who knows what. It could be the doctor telling you, easy, to put your things in order. That's our life on this planet. The only for sure bomb shelter is the church of the living God. Ain't no nuke going to be able to touch that. That kingdom, the Lord said, will never be destroyed. There ain't no army. There ain't no bomb. There's nothing that can harm you. And that's what we got to be prepared for. That's all. We're not to worry about some of this crazy stuff happening. Even when we set about locking our door after people have gone in and did bad things to people, and I'm holding back because of the kids, about, well, you know what happened. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to lock the door and do our own thing. No problem. We're prepared. Woe to anyone who would think they would try to pull some stunt. <laughs> He'd be surprised. He'd be calling 911. <laughs> if he's able. But you get my point. We don't have to worry about any of these things. And I feel sorry for people that were momentarily absolutely terrorized by what they thought was going to happen. And maybe that was just a great time to have that maybe little mishap because it put a whole lot of people thinking, especially the people in the emergency preparedness, to make sure they are prepared to get good, adequate warning to people that need it for what good it would do them. And to not have mistakes in the future. You know, we all need to be a bit prepared. So that's just to be encouraging for us today, uh, brethren, because that day of the Lord will come, and we just need to be prepared, not only prepared, but hasten it by our holy conversation and godliness. To say, as the end of the Bible actually says, with all that spooky stuff that's happening, Re Revelation with all the purple people eaters and all kinds of stuff happening, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. We even so come, Lord Jesus. We want him to come because we're ready. We are prepared. Thank you for your attention this morning.